um, now I'm <laughs> proud to present to you uh, Christoph Engmann, who works at the University of Weimar and is <clears throat> working on the um, state uh, identity management, as far as I understood it. Yeah. Um, please welcome <laughs> him. Well, uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and um, thank you to the Chaos Computer Club for the invitation. I'm happy that so many people found their way here for my talk. Um, I, I will try to talk mostly freely because um, as an academic I'm usually reading stuff and bore people to death and I try not to do that tonight. So um, can any, everybody understand me? And I have to move this way and that way. That's like human Tetris. <laughs> okay. Here? Okay. Well, so um, um, just a little more about my person. So um, I don't work on state identity systems. I actually um, uh, would refuse to do so. What I do is um, I look into the history of state identity systems. And what I'm going to present today is sort of a rough, short um, overview um, over 500 years of um, writing people and giving people identities. Um, by proto-states and by nation-states as we know them today. Um, and the whole goal of, the, of, of this endeavor is to give some context, some historical uh, background to some of the events we um, witness today, um, which I'm going to talk about later in the talk. So, um, first, um, of course, this notion, what is in a name, is kind of a lame Shakespearean uh, überstrapazierte Floskel, uh, taken from the drama of uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yet what I want to show is, um, you know, romantic attentions are pretty mood. Naming is a rather unromantic thing. So let me first start um, with the question, who in this room has no name? So everybody has a name. Um, does anybody know anybody who has no name? So obviously having a name is something that everybody ha has and that we take as normal. And um, it's actually a fact that in our world everybody has to have a name and I'm going to give some background on that um, in the course of the talk. So um, it's quite astonishing that we now live in a world where every human being, and not only human being, also animals and things, sort of have names. I mean, with things and animals is different, um, because usually there's no documentation um, for the names, except for cattle, where there's actually quite sophisticated systems to track cattle through its life course, um, uh, from birth to the slaughterhouse. Um, of course, these are not really names but numbers, but still, they are identifiable. For humans, um, people have to have names, and that is legal names. A name that is documented in some sort of paper certificate and tied to certain rights and obligations that we sometimes enjoy and sometimes dread. So, um, certain, um, as a, the rights, for example, would be the rights of the protection by the state or some sort of welfare entitlements like um, free health care, or not free health care, probably universal health care, or schooling, or so forth. And obligations could be the draft, um, or um, being denied to leave a country. All these rights and obligations are um, allocated by using those uh, addresses we call names. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is to trace the genealogy Sort of, sort of the history of this astonishing situation that everybody has a name um, in its historical developments. And of course I already um, started saying that this is sort of like a very rough and short in look, uh, look into the history of it. It's uh, of course far more complex than reality. And um, as the title of my talk implies, um, we start 500 years ago in the 1500s, 
And um, um, so why in the 1500s? Um, two events in this time frame, late uh, 15th century, early 16th century, brought the very rough um, beginnings of what we now have as naming systems um, into existence, and that is namely the Reformation on the one hand, and um, on the other hand, the discovery of what then was called Neva España, um, or Las Indias, or what we now call America. Um, for most part of the Middle Ages and the times before the Roman Empire and Greece is different, um, only nobles um, and clerics and some sort of official persons like lawyers and so forth um, had fixed and written down names and of course their privileges were tied um, to these names and the documents that proved them. If you couldn't present a certain sort of letter that showed your knight as appointed by the king so-and-so, you of course weren't an, this knight, right? So losing this letter actually uh, would have provided, uh, uh, given you big problems. Um, so quite literally, your name was your status. For ordinary people, um, this uh, didn't apply. Of course they had names, um, but naming practices basically differed widely in Europe, and um, if you can speak of Europe or Germany or even territories in this historical context. Um, so people had names, but the, there were no real laws regulating what names they uh, needed or had to have and uh, what they did with it. Um, they actually were free to choose their name and to change the name over the life course and obviously, as far as we can tell, uh, quite frequently <coughs> did so. Um, also, it was quite common that ordinary people just had a single name. So they had a first name and that, that's it and probably uh, were addressed by the first name and, and the village or town or whatever of their origin. Um, as I said, from the 1500s on this starts to change and profoundly so. Um, after the Reformation, um, that is 40 years after the Reformation, 1545, the Pope, the Catholic church leader, summoned um, theologists and priests and um, uh, bishops uh, in Trient. The Reformation had spread over wide parts of Europe and after almost a thousand years uh, of a monopoly uh, in metaphysical and religious um, relations, so to say, the Catholic church had suffered uh, pretty severe blows and a considerable loss of influence. And among the measures to control and contain the spread of Protestantism, the Council of Trient, which was, as you see, almost 20 years long and had 25 um, uh, different meetings um, in, in the course of these years, the Council of Trient um, required the priest that the sacrament of baptism was now just not just only a writing event, so to say, a writing event in the soul of the newborn. Um, Church Father Augustine had described uh, baptism um, as such that um, applying water and the rites of baptism would mark the soul of the newborn with an indelible mark by God, which um, then for its whole life would mark it as a Christian. So um, this sort of metaphysical writing event now was to become a real writing event as the priests were now required to actually write down in church books whom they baptized. Essentially meaning that the Catholic Church started to try to register and count their flock, to register and count who was Catholic and who was not. Um, this event more or less marks uh, the invention of um, organized birth registry in Europe. Um, from now on, all Catholic-born individuals should have been written down in the church books. Of course, reality looked much different. Um, priests didn't comply with this um, rule, um, and um, church books were only uh, kept very inconsistently, and the practices differed widely from area to area in Europe. Um, yet. The process of birth registry as a bureaucratic measure was established 
and uh, that the church sort of maintains some sort of apparatus for this would prove as important uh, much later on in history. Um, what we also have here is the first occurrence of a practice of fixation of a name to an individual in the sense of the fixation in the sense of writing it down. Uh, the Catholic Church, which was the first and also the oldest bureaucracy in Europe, um, had already a thousand years of continuous operation behind it in 1500 and applied, started to apply its bureaucratic know-how to the prob problem of generating Christian identities. The name, of course, was given in the name of God and fixated via the double writing event of baptism in the soul and on the paper. And um, so now you might ask, what about the Protestants and the Jews and other people in Europe? They, of course, weren't registered. The Protestant church, which was not such a monolithic entity as the Catholic church and still isn't a monolithic entity, um, didn't um, register newborns or baptisms. And for Jewish people, if, uh, it was uh, different altogether. The second big event uh, of the 1500s was the discovery, so this is Columbus uh, landing in San Salvador, of America by Christopher Columbus. And um, this provided a big challenge to the established system of ruling a territory um, as it existed in the medieval ages. That was kings used to move around over their um, country, over their territories, and establish sort of their, their power, their rule, by making themselves present. There's a whole, um, there's a big ceremonial aspect to, it, to that, how the king would present himself, what sort of representat representatives would be surrounded by him, and what distance, and so forth. Uh, most people uh, in Germany in school have been treated by the stories of Karl the Great and how, also Karl der Große, how he traveled um, his, uh, his territories. And, and this was exactly this, um, this modus of ruling by presence. Um, of course, this uh, proved to be difficult to establish on the other side of the Atlantic. It was just too dangerous to put the king uh, the Spanish king in this case, on a ship that would spend three to four weeks on a very dangerous trip over the ocean, have him do his tour, so to say, in the new territories, which still were quite uncharted and um, only um, um, little um, colonized or uh, inhabited. inhabited. Um, so the Spanish king or the Spanish crown had to invent some way of making the king present on the other side of the Atlantic. And what we have in this period of roughly 50, 60 years in the second half of the 16th century is sort of the innovation of the bureaucratic operating system as we know it today. That is the presence of the power on paper. Um, what Philip II, who was then um, king in mid-16th century, uh, of Spanish um, invented was a system with the help of, of the Catholic Church in that case, actually with the help of the Inquisition, that required uh, two things, m many more things, but two things that are important in this uh, context. First, that everything on the other side of the Atlantic was to be written down. They actually had this idea of what they call the interior uh, noticia de la cosa, so every, quite literally, everything happening in the new territories was to be documented, put on a ship back to Sevilla where uh, Philip II reigned, and they're somehow processed and you know, um, used for, for ruling these distant uh, territories. Um, Philip II spent so much time studying papers that he was called the paper king which was quite unusual for this time to have an actually literate a uh, king who was interested in this weird thing, paper. And paper, on, uh, on another note, was at that point only 200 years old, or 150 years old in Europe. Um, crusaders had brought it from the Islamic countries, from their conquests. And within a hundred years, paper had pushed away parchment and pergament, which were very expensive, uh, very rare writing matters. Um, where such a system where you write down everything actually would be um, 
unattainable on because you, first of all it was too expensive and second um, um, you couldn't just cross out things that were wrong and this is actually what uh, started uh, a practice that was started in this context I'm going to show that soon so um, give me a second So the second part, the second important uh, thing that uh, Philip II required was that every person that was going to be um, a citizen of the new territories of Nueva España had to be registered. And these were quite normal people. Um, I mean, there was this vast, uh, vast amount of land to be settled and um, the Spanish crown tried to claim these territories by sending lots of people over there. But at the same time, they wanted to make sure they can control who's actually um, going uh, on ships and is actually going to become a citizen uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So for the first time in history, ordinary people had to appear in front, um, except for, for courts, right? Uh, but here in this case had to appear in front of, of secretaries, of writers, and had to tell their lives in order uh, a, dis a decision could be made if they were worthy of becoming settlers in the new territories. And uh, one reason this, um, this measure was undertaken was um, that they wanted to sort out men running away from the women. This is sort of the biggest topic uh, in the, in the uh, contemporary uh, documents. <clears throat> so the, the innovation that we have here, and here's also the cancellation uh, visible, is, and that is a difference to what the Catholic Church did with the birth registries, is actual registers. So the people get asked, then they get a permission, some sort of certificate, that they can enter a ship, which is then seven times actually checked before um, they uh, go out on the Atlantic, and then checked again when they arrive on the other side of the Atlantic. But every one of these certificates would be registered in, uh, in such a book. And um, this sort of very simple measure of actually making a document of a document, of writing down what sort of files of certificates of letters you hand out was historically a quite new innovation. It had been introduced by uh, Frederick II in the 14th century or 15th, 14th century in Sicily, um, but was not widely in use. And um, Philip II required that every one of the certificates had to be written down. And so these entries read names. I actually can't read this. I took this from this book, which I highly recommend. Um, um, they. Uh, their, the names and then description of their lives and whenever somebody actually left they would cross out, these are these lines here, the entry. And that again is something that you rarely did on parchment or pergament. You just didn't cross out stuff because the this writing matter was just too valuable to overwrite stuff, right? With paper you suddenly have the possibility to throw away data. And, or to, to, uh, to erase data, and this is what, what in a way is happening here. It's made invalid. Um, there, there's an, another process, another documentation progress that now can start after this has been crossed out. Okay, so this is very roughly and very briefly the story of two things that happened in the 16th century where some, on the one hand, the Catholic Church, on the other hand, some proto-state like um, the Spanish state started uh, large-scale um, attempts to register individuals and to fix their names because this system also implied that once you were written down and had the certificate that this name was your name and you were to be identified under this name um, for the rest of, the li of your life uh, at least in the context of, of the Spanish uh, bureaucracy of, of that time. <clears throat> okay. So the, se the 17th century was mostly a lost century in Europe. The Thirty Year War basically 
uh, destroyed much of the existing structures. Um, but with the end of the Thirty Year War in 1648 and the, uh, the what is it called in English, the Westfalische Frieden, the Westphalian Peace, probably, or Westphalian Treaty, uh, we see the emergence of what we now call statehood, of modern statehood, um, and the slow development of organized bureaucracies um, that could actually cope with the bureaucracy of the church. And um, birth registration in this time still remains a very spotty practice, solely practiced by the church. Um, but in France, we, there is a development that these ecclesial birth registries become important in court cases. So if you appear uh, in front of court, you have to show your, uh, um, not your birth certificate, but that a priest had actually written down your baptism. Also what starts to appear is, um, or more widely used, um, is family names, is um, uh, the, what we now deem as normal, the fact that we don't only have this given name, but a family name. Uh, these family names were used uh, in legal contracts um, for commodity exchange and things like that. But again, there's no uniform um, or standardized way of, of using um, the last name. Um, things really start to change um, only late, much later, almost a hundred years later in the 18th century and that um, uh, is under the enlightenment rule of some uh, uh, kings uh, in Europe. Namely, for example, um, Joseph II of Austria who was the first who required um, that priest made a copy of um, the baptism record and supplied this co copy to the state. So this was the first sort of secularization of birth registration, this was in 1780, so 200, more than 200 years after uh, the Council of Trient. And, oh wait, I forgot one little bit which is funny, Trust Centers 1560. Um, let me just jump back to <laughs> Philip II because um, this register I, I showed in the picture before were actually stored in this building, the Casa de la Contratación in, uh, in Sevilla. And all these papers I talked about that were created and compiled in, in the new territories also were sent to this, um, uh, uh, to this building where all the clerks would process um, uh, these papers. So one could say it's sort of a trust center because if you were written down in this and there was a register uh, entry, even if you have lost your certificate, you actually existed. So this is the, at least for the Spanish crown, uh, this was the uh, um, Westphalian piece, and this is Joseph II. So Joseph II was the first to secularize the um, church practice of birth registration and made it a requirement for every priest to make a copy and actually um, enforce this uh, quite strongly. He also introduced something else which we don't think about anymore today and this is house numbers. Um, birth registration as well as house numbering um, in Austria and in many other territories that would later um, apply these measures too uh, was of, of course part of, um, of the draft of finding out how many men uh, suitable for military service a given territory uh, had. And um, if you register births, you can see how many men are born and then it's easy to calculate how many soldiers you will have, 16 or 18 or how many years uh, you want to uh, let them live uh, without serving the military uh, you have later on. Um, house numbers, which is another addressing scheme, which is sort of not a name, but important to actually be able to find people in a given territory. Uh, we're not introduced to deliver po uh, mail, right? Um, it's not a postal invention, it's an invention um, in the context of, of military service and the draft. 
<clears throat> so, but the real event in these years that led to the eventual total secularization of birth registration occurred, of course, in 1789 in French, the French Revolution. The French Constitution, as ratified by the French National Convent in 1791, contains the passage, the legislative authority will establish for all inhabitants without distinction the manner in which birth, marriages, and deaths will be certified, and it will designate the public officials who will receive and maintain these files. So this is the first such law in Europe, um, and it's quite clearly that um, the French revolutionaries or the new French nation um, deems birth registration as, um, as one of its tasks and also an important task. Um, so it would designate the public officials, of course, also means that priests were not the secretaries or the individuals um, writing down births anymore. Um, what we here see is some sort of beamto or secretaries of the state who, um, who start to administer life events like birth, marriage, later unemployment, and, and these kinds of things. Um, also, it's important to note that it says without distinction. Again, remember, um, naming systems, I mean, this is the end of feudal times, naming and uh, um, fixed names and documented names were still an important element of um, feudal rule and uh, a privilege of the nobles. So this is actually quite revolutionary that the French revolutionaries say without distinction everybody is going to be registered and is going to get some sort of certificate that um, shows who he is. So liberty, egalité, fraternité implied that everybody was treated equal and not at least bureauc bureaucratically. <clears throat> so originally, the civil status laws in France required that any birth was to be registered within 24 hours, which of course proved to be impractical. Um, but the important point here is that, if you will, entering the territory from within by birth becomes an event that states start to take great interest in and start to regulate, in which they make into some sort of an entry into the writing system of the state, into the documentary regime that a state has. Um, also, this means that, and there's actually a lot more like legal uh, detail to this, uh, which, which I don't show here, um, that the uh, French state now deemed this name that was given in this writing event to be fixed to the individual for over the lifetime and actually um, uh, brought forward a law that made it near impossible to change the name once it was written down um, in this manner. This is true to this day. Uh, France has uh, some of the toughest laws uh, when it comes to name change. It's equally difficult in Germany or in Switzerland. If you try to change your name, um, you're, in tr you, you're in trouble. <clears throat> well, yeah, marriage is... Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> Excuse me? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Just for the stream, uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, even with marriage was the question. So what, what about the, the laws for... There's another question? Excuse me? Okay. Okay. Can, could you say that again? Okay. Uh, for uh, my age, you can keep your name, have both name, or check your uh, husband or wife name because it's working, but it's a recent change in law. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Germany and Switzerland, as far as I know, have changed these laws quite recently too. Recently is like in the last 20, 10 or 15 years. Um, so what happens if you marry somebody? Do you keep your last name? Uh, do you choose an altogether new name? Um, what happens in the case of divorce? Can you get your old name back? And these kinds of things. I mean, this all shows this is a heavy regulated area. And 
the origins of this regulation lie in these kinds of events in, in you know, the French Revolution um, and the Code, uh, code Civil um, uh, brought forward by Napoleon a few years later. <clears throat> so let, let me get back again to this fixed name. Um, what we also have here is sort of the legalization in the sense of or the creation of the legal re requirement of what we now um, deem as normal names. And this is patrilinear um, given name, last name uh, formats. Patrilinear means your last name comes down from your father and um, all naming systems um, that nation states use uh, work by this format. And uh, we expect, uh, usually expect it uh, to be this way. Recently there have been changes to this and in some, in some countries you're actually allowed uh, to keep your mother's name and so forth uh, when you're registered, uh, when your birth is registered. <coughs> So at the same time, this guy, uh, Jeremy Bentham, um, lamented that there's a problem with all these naming regimes uh, starting to emerge um, in modern nation states. And that is, it is to be regretted that the proper names of individuals are upon so irregular a footing. Those distinctions invented in the infancy of society, and infancy of society is probably what he thinks of uh, the 16th or 17th century, um, to provide for the wants of a Hamlet only imperfectly accomplished the object in a great nation. Bentham instead called for, oh, I got this here, for a new nomenclature uh, so arranged that in a whole nation every individual should have a proper name which should belong to him alone. So too many John Smiths make it pretty difficult um, to identify an individual. Um, and Bentham's idea was to introduce a new nomenclature, a new system, um, a three-part name consisting of the first and the last name and a word composed from uh, the date of birth and the location of birth. Um, Bentham also tackled another problem that would occupy many identity experts, if you want to call them that way, uh, throughout the 19th century. The problem that ac people can actually still change their names even though they have written down names, that is um, you could just uh, move to another city and use a different name and probably get away with it even uh, if uh, there is a bureaucratic regime uh, in place that uh, should prevent that. So Bentham had observed that British sailors would tattoo their names in well-formed and indelible characters um, to their wrist so that their bodies may be known in case of shipwreck. <clears throat> Such writing in the body as an identification practice was actually pretty common in Europe, um, but not to record, record names via tattoos or other means, instead creating marks in the body by cutting or branding or by by other uh, measures, was both a practice of positive and negative stigmatization. Positive in certain religious contexts like the Crusades, um, who were brandings to show that they actually uh, were members, um, uh, were, uh, belonged to, or actually, how do you say that, actually were part of the Crusades. And uh, the negative uh, stigmatization, um, of course, is criminal identification or identification of heretics. Um, for example, thieves had their ears slit, um, which we still uh, know by the term Schlitzohr in German. Um, arsonists were branded in certain parts of the body and so forth. So this is basically writing in the body as a social stigmatization, sig a social signaling system. Such writing in the body, um, in a sense a crude and brutal uh, signal system, vanished uh, during the first half of the 19th century. And what instead um, emerged is something that we still to do today uh, when we try to create an uh, identity, and that is reading the body. Um, the, emerg the emerging science of criminology 
um, in the discursive context of Darwinist theories of uh, hereditary uh, criminal behavior um, and colonialism were the context um, of these discourses of reading the body. So we're now in the second half of the 19th century, almost 400 years after the discovery of America and after the Reformation. Um, modern nation states in the West had by then uh, established themselves and within 40 years after the French Revolution, all European countries had impl implemented similar uh, birth registration laws like in France. Um, that is in the sense that every birth has to be registered by some official and um, that uh, people were not allowed anymore to change their names with the exception of England. In England, it was still legal until I think 1899 or something like that, that you could change your name by just announcing it publicly. For example, you would put an ad in a paper and say, I'm not John Smith anymore, I'm Adam Smith or something, and that would be a, a legal name change. Every other country in Europe made it pretty hard, next to impossible, to change your name once, once it was registered in that sense. <clears throat> So still criminals, so at least many people thought, were those people who changed their names because that was one way of getting away, um, uh, away from the police or getting away from being caught. Um, so the second half of the 19th century saw the emergence of the variety of technologies that, uh, that tried to make the body into a resource to read out, so to, so to say, the body to make the body a resource for identification practices. The first and um, most widely used, the first successful and most widely used system was uh, the anthropometry um, invented by the French police clerk, uh, clerk Alphonse Bertillon. Um, identity administration in police, depart in police departments in this time was, so to say, close to inexistent. Bertillon had worked at the Paris Police Prefecture and found himself with a con uh, confronted with a collection of close to 100,000 files of criminals that lacked the most basic sorting scheme and identification was uh, done via description and names and a typical card in this collection would read something like short, fair-skinned, big nose. Sometimes photographs were attached, sometimes um, there are uh, no, sometimes photographs were attached, but in any case there were no real standards for describing individuals and also not uh, how to photograph individuals. So there, there was no pot shot as we know it today that you have to stand in a certain way, a certain light and you know, your profile and so forth. So re-identification was basically at the convenience of, of the policeman processing the individual in question. Bertillon, whose father had been a famous anthropologist, um, started uh, to tackle the problem of re-identification. And we're not talking about ordinary people here. This is a, in the context of um, processing criminals. This is the context of police work. Um, we're um, identifying what the discourse of the time called recidivists. So people who um, were... Uh, um, who had already uh, done criminal things and then were caught again, um, which was also viewed as caused by biolog biological causes in, 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 the, uh, in that time. So to re-identify these individuals, um, Bertillon developed a system, and uh, you see a, a picture depicting this here, um, by uh, which consisted in measuring the body of um, adults. It didn't work with children, of course, because uh, children grow, so the body changes too much. Um, his reasoning was that uh, the body was a source for identification, that certain bodily features uh, differ enough from person to person um, to um, to be used for identification, and that with adults, certain parts of the body don't change over time. So he created a system of 11 measurements, including the circumference and length of the head, the length of the left foot, this is what you see here, um, 
the uh, length of the left underarm, the span of a person, which is measured on, in, in this picture. And um, these measurements had to be uh, um, undertaken meticulously by trained personnel. So slight variations in how the foot would sit on this podest and so forth would actually change the measurement and uh, provide problems later on when identifying or re-identifying an individual. Um, but the real invention is not this measurement uh, regime that Bertillon came up with. Um, the problem still was that this, was this would create heaps of data that in some way needed to be classified and then be searchable and sorted. And um, his anthropometric system served this problem by using another fairly new medium, and that is index cards. Index cards um, were originally int uh, introduced in the context of libraries, and actually there um, were the backsides of playing cards because these were the only cards that would be readily available of this size, uh, cheap, and in a standardized uh, uh, manner. So um, index cards helped um, to sort things, uh, books and other things, and Bertillon applied, it to so, uh, applied index cards to sort people. Um, from the measurements taken from the individual, uh, Bertillon would create a code. Um, so the measurements are written down in the, the top and lower um, lines, and there would, would also always be a photograph uh, applied to the card. So it was not only the, uh, these measurements that were used for identification pr purposes, but also the, the photograph. From the measurements taken, uh, Bertillon would create uh, a code, sort of an abridged version. Um, this means circumference, uh, right, uh, what was it again? Uh, right toe of one centimeter and so forth. So this is basically an abridged version, a code. Um, and the index cards were then divided in a big um, sorting uh, cabinet, first by sex, and then subclassified simply alphabetically with the first letter of this, this code. By doing this, um, Bertillon could split up 100, 120,000 index cards into groups of 12, and um, these would be in a little, uh, in drawers, in little uh, compartments. And um, once a measurement was taken and uh, encoded in this manner, one could actually very quickly uh, browse, so to say, to the um, compartment in question and find out if this individual had been measured, had, been, had undergone a Bertinage before. So what this basically is, uh, it's a search engine for people. And it worked marvelously and um, revolutionized um, identification techniques in the 1880s and 1890s. Of course, it had its problem. I'm problems. I'm going to say a little bit about that soon. Basically, the discourse that brought the breakthrough, and this is not unimportant for our contemporary debates um, for Bertillon's system, was not criminals, but anarchists. Um, the system was used to identify uh, some prominent anarchists in the 1880s and 1890s, um, and thus uh, um, gained widespread uh, popularity. Mm. Wait a second. So around 1900s, anthropometrics were at their peak, but it was already uh, began already to be challenged um, by a system that is still in use today, and that is fingerprinting or dactyloscopy. Um, the original fingerprinting is a long and complicated story, and as always with scientific discoveries and cultural, practice, uh, cultural practices, uh, 
there are many heroic stories of inventing and fingerprinting, of course, is ripe with it. But the truth is that fingerprinting wasn't really invented, uh, but emerged, emerged in many different places in the last decades of the 19th century. The important point for today is um, that the first widely used fingerprinting system emerged in colonial contexts. Um, in the words of colonial clerks in the uh, 1880s, Indians look bewilderingly homogeneous. So they couldn't tell the people they were, um, they were to rule apart, and they also couldn't tell their names apart. Right? They spoke a different language, um, they looked different, and um, this became important not least in the context of dispersing pensions because many Indians in uh, India were um, employed by the British government or had served in the army and then um, uh, were eligible for pensions. And um, apparently there was a lot of pension fraud, at least that is what British officials um, report. And um, stemming from the fact that they couldn't distinguish uh, one person from the other when it came uh, uh, to the office, presented some, you know, name uh, and said it's eligible, he or she is eligible, he in, actually is eligible for pensions. So, oops, this is one too far. Um, in order to prevent fraud, the British officer started to experiment uh, with Bertillon's system, but found it not applicable. Muss ich zum Ende kommen? Bitte? Okay. Dann machen wir ganz schnell. Um, they start to experiment with uh, anthropometric systems and found it inapplicable um, to colonial subjects. And this is when they, when actually the, the invention of, or when, when they started to experiment with fingerprints. And again, the problem here was that um, a classification system is needed, right? Um, it had been discovered uh, quite early that fingerprints actually are individual and don't change over the lifetime. Still, it's quite difficult um, to create some sort of uh, system uh, that allows it, like Bertillon system did, to easily search a lot of prints, right? And again, the solution was to translate the visual uh, to sort of code, and this basically is worlds, loops, whir worlds, loops. Was uh, das? Warum sind wir jetzt nicht mehr da? Okay. So this pattern is a whirl. This is a loop. And here are ten fingers that have worlds and loops. The problem is uh, these prints are not distributed um, evenly. So about ninety percent of the people have these worlds, so it's, um, you create a lot of uh, mismatches very easily. More complicated systems late, invented later, this is the Henry system which was still in use until a few years ago, divided the fingers in even and uneven fingers and further sub-qualified um, the patterns on, on this, uh, the, apparent, the patterns that appeared on the fingers. Again, the point here is um, that these systems translated the body into information and made identification at a distance possible because such a code could be transmitted with the media of the time that is the postal system and the telegraph to basically any given place in the world and it would be possible to identify an individual by reading out the fingerprints with the classification system that would render the optical into this code. Um, and this is um, basically uh, what we still do today when we biometrically identify individuals. We use the body as a resource to generate some sort of uh, code which allows us then to see if this individual already has been registered. So, um, of course, some people had the brilliant idea that names um, have this property of not being attached to a body and that people could change names however 
a sophisticated to bureaucratic regime of writing down names is. So why not use these codes as names themselves? And this, of course, uh, was something that some uh, people in, in the early 20th century debated. Uh, this is uh, Juan Vuketic, an Argentinian dactyloscopist who invented uh, his own system, similar to the one I just showed. And um, he had the idea that finger fingerprints would allow um, to track the origin and civil evolution of each person, that is birth, marriage, death, judicial sentences, and so forth. So remember what the, what the passage from the French constitution said. Right? It's the same life events. In that context, it was the birth registration that would allow to administer these things, to administrate these things. Here, it's the fingerprint. Here, the body becomes the means to address an individual in a bureaucratic context. And, um, Vuketic uh, pupil Alamandos then brought this to the logical conclusion and uh, had this idea that we could have a number starting with epsilon because epsilon is an Indian word for uh, legal tie um, generated from the fingerprints and that this number would be the individual himself, it would be the civil person of every man and by this the person would be known uh, given rights and held responsible for his actions. And he called for an universal right for identification. So he had the idea that this is actually something akin to human rights. The possibility to be identified and thus uh, be treated um, according to one's actions. Okay. So, since we are out of time, let me just jump over what comes now. Um, this is the situation 1900. The 20th century, you have the two wars, you have lots of displaced pe uh, people in Europe, uh, you have the introduction of the passport system, which actually was not in place before World War I. Um, what we now know that we have this passport and that is a, um, necessary to travel uh, actually is a historically relatively young phenomenon, 80, 90 years old. And again, all identification systems, and this is the, in the context of the passport, serve the contradictory desires of government to both control movement and to encourage international mobility. So on the one hand, you are, um, you should travel. On the other hand, um, many nation states don't want you to travel. And if you have a passport, a German passport, a US passport, you're actually pretty mobile. You can go to pretty much any of the 190 or so countries in the world. If you have an Afghani passport or a passport from some country from the sub-Sahara, you can't go anywhere. Um, so this document um, controls your movement quite, um, quite well. Okay. So let me come to the conclusion. <coughs> ID cards, um, I jump over this, can talk that, about that later uh, in, after the talk. So, coming to an end, what is in a name? First, um, we saw in the genealogy that naming and, name and identity regimes emerge in economic, military, colonial, social welfare. I haven't talked about this, this is ID cards. Right? ID cards um, are common in countries that have welfare that have established welfare systems because it's an easy tool to actually identify you as a citizen or, uh, and then, and with this, as eligible for certain welfare services like universal health care, education, and so forth. Right? Countries that don't have big welfare systems like Great Britain or uh, the US don't have ID cards. Great Britain had ID cards but abandoned it after World War II. Um, and migratory contexts. Um, secondly, names are not a matter of choice. They are mandatory in any modern nation state. Um, and this is historically a quite new development, only about 150 years old that most countries have implemented these laws. Thirdly, the reference of the law is the body. Um, this whole lengthy um, presentation on biometrics 
uh, was to make the point that the problem for all these identity regimes is the gap between the body and the document. Right? Every identity regime that nation states try to establish attempt to close this gap. Right? If you have a name that is on a paper, it's still not in your body, um, so you can easily change it. The anthropometric system, the dactyloscopy, and modern systems basically create names from the body by reading out the body um, that could serve as an address uh, for administrative purposes. Right? So, and this is because the rule of law needs, um, if you trace a chain of, of events, to be able to trace any chain of events back to an individual's body. Right? Who did what, when, where? This is what any lawyer or any judge will want to know at a certain point. And if something happens is not written down beforehand, there's a whole regime of measures to actually write it down after the fact. That is forensics. And you all enjoy that in CSI every evening um, to have an event that was not written down and then the whole regime uh, of forensics is applied and sort of puts it onto paper what happened somewhere. Okay. So identity is duplication, I also jumped over that. All the systems basically create identity by duplicating. You have a registry and then you have a certificate. Right? The identity is actually the relation between the registry and the certificate. Without such duplication, uh, nobody can prove uh, the validity of these documents. Ident and identity regimes, at least nation states, monopolize these registers. <clears throat> identity systems uh, change as media change. Um, again, now we have a new medium in which we interact, which is the internet, and we have a change of identity systems. Again, something probably for the discussion or for later on. Last but least, what I want to say is to govern is to address, right? So any system that wants to govern needs to establish addresses, and this is what we see today. India um, creates a biometric system for all its um, uh, citizens, and it does so to provide welfare, at least that's what they say. Right? The German attempt to create digital addresses is well known, it's the uh, Elektronische Personalausweis, which of course doesn't work <laughs> so far. And the American attempt is this, right? Initiate the debate, um, how trusted identities in cyberspace look like. This is happening right now. We don't know what the American system will look like, but basically to govern is to address means uh, the American government has to figure out how to address its people in digital sphere. Coming to my conclusion, what I wanted to show is that in the name there's always somebody else. Usually it's some sort of state entity. It used to be the church, right, or God. Right? The question and this National uh, Initiative for Secure Trusted Identities uh, actually brings this question to the American public is, can we choose who the somebody else is today? And this is what hackers and activists and politicians and everybody else can play a role in. How are we going to be addressed? How will our names look like? How are we to be found and find others um, in the context of a digital medium? Thank you. Thank you for your um, great talk. Um, since the time has run quite long, um, I th say we can have two questions. Two questions. Are there any ideas or concepts uh, that would elaborate on um, how the system of names could be transcended, not in a way as to automatically close the gap you have described by, say, automatic identification, but um, by questioning uh, the very need of uh, unique names and uh, maybe go into uh, concepts like arbitrary pseudonymity? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, establishing some sort of address, if it's called a name or whatever, does not mean that um, uh, anonymous speech or pseudonymous speech uh, w uh, needs to go away. I mean, the simplest way to introduce a digital identification system is a real name policy, right? Just translate the real name into cyberspace and attach it to every act you do in that space. This, of course, raises privacy questions um, and issues. Um, and um, as far as I can see, at least in the Western countries, what this American discussion does, and also what is done in the context of the Gesundheitskarte and other means of, you know, using digital signature, which is sort of like the legal name um, in cyberspace in Germany, is that they're actually pretty privacy aware and um, try to establish um, procedures that would allow you to be on the one hand um, addressable but on the other hand, speak anonymously or pseudonymously. Um, the, the discussion is actually quite advanced in that context. Uh, these, these people are not simply trying to, um, to establish real name politics uh, in, the, in the cyberspace. Is there another question? Do you actually have something to say regarding uh, your eyes uh, or the work of Tim Berners-Lee on naming test of independent invention or something, uh, how that affects the current debate? Because we actually can choose who this somebody else is if we own a namespace, like for example a domain name on yeah. the internet. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, of course there's like many, many na naming systems and uh, systems uh, for addressing in different contexts. The context I'm, tr I tr I'm trying to talk about here, or try to show some, some background information on, is how people are identified and addressed. And historically, um, people are identified and addressed by names, and later on this, this relation between the name and the body becomes a problem, and it's basically a problem since the last 150 years where many different attempts have been made to fix it, like fingerprinting and, you know, and uh, uh, other means of biometrics. Um, identifying things like uh, digital objects or URIs or, or even real objects um, can be done in many different ways. The question is, will nation states start to regulate this too? And if you look at certain projects that, for example, the bon Bundesdruckerei does, uh, in, in, um, uh, at least does research on, you see that um, they're actually thinking about how you could identify things um, and digital processes in the context of such federal identification systems, which again they do because of copyright issues, pat patent laws and these kinds of things. Right? Um, once you're in the digital realm, it doesn't matter what the data references, if it's a person or, not, or uh, uh, a thing. I mean, cryptographically, it's, it's just a string of characters, right? Um, but what matters is, do people transact um, among, with people or with things or uh, with di digital events and so forth? And do these transactions entail some sort of legal entitlements, uh, economic value and so forth? where some sort of regulatory uh, need arises. Regulatory need, for example, like taxation, customs, copyright um, control, um, and probably even cr uh, criminal uh, issues. Right? So um, I fully expect at, at a certain point that this whole internet of things and how things are addressed digitally will sort of merge with this discussion to a certain extent. And that, that is a completely different thing and would be worthy looking into. <laughs>